for 20 years, there has been an event taking place annually in the historic town of Hoyk in the Scottish Borders, which has been growing exponentially. The Hoyk Reavers Festival first took place in 2003 and has taken place every year since, including two years of virtual festivals during the coronavirus pandemic. But what is the Reavers Festival? Well, I sat down with Wendy Tate, who is a member of Hoyk Reavers Festival Committee, to hear more about what the festival is, but firstly, what the Reavers were. Well, really, to tell you who the Reavers were, I've got to go back in time, around about a thousand years, to a time before Scotland and England existed in the way they do now. What we think of as Britain was divided up into a number of different kingdoms. And where we're sitting right now in Hoyk, that was part of the Kingdom of Northumbria. And that covered what was now south and north of the border. It wasn't really until the 13th century that the border started to get established roughly where it is now, but it was very, very fluid. And over the next two, three hundred years, it was an area of warfare. The English against the Scottish, the Scottish against the English. The border constantly moved. It was being invaded by England. Scotland were invading England. So you can get a picture of what this area must have been like. It was constantly war-torn, absolutely ravaged. There's no point planting crops because they're gonna get ravaged by the soldiers when they come across. The only way you can live is by your livestock. Now, if your livestock get destroyed by the enemy, you need to steal somebody else's livestock. Now, then they're gonna be annoyed about that and they're gonna to want to steal yours back. And so this is how reaving came to be. It was a way of life, a way of surviving. Now, because you were neither Scottish nor English in your mind, in your own feeling, the only allegiance you could really have was to your family your surname, and you, you see the term surname all the time connected with reavers, because you couldn't trust the English crown, you couldn't trust the Scottish crown. You needed protection. You needed protection from your family. And your family would make allegiances with other families to make you stronger. But equally, you would be at feud with other families and groups of families. So this reaving, this stealing of cattle, and many other acts of violence as well, wasn't just across the border, it was between your neighbours as well. In fact, this place was so lawless that a whole set of laws were set up that were neither Scottish or English. They were known as the, uh, the border laws, and they were specifically to combat this way of life of reaving. But it's the only way people could survive. And is that what makes it so like, connected to Hoyk, is because of its geographical location? Absolutely. Hoyk was right at the centre of where this was happening. We were only 14 miles from the border. We're right in the middle of the country. We're in the Scottish Middle March. That was absolutely at the heart of border country. So what does the Reavers Festival then celebrate, if that's what it's all about? Well, I don't know whether we celebrate it so much, because it was a lawless time and a violent time, but we do need to commemorate it. Now, in English schools, you won't find any of this taught. You won't find it on the Scottish curriculum. But it's really important that if people are going to connect with their homes, with their lands, with their ancestry, that they understand a little bit about the history and what was unique about this area. So it's really important that people actually learn about their heritage. And so is that why, the, like, who would you say the Reavers Festival is for then? Is it for like just Hoyt people or is it for a much wider audience? Oh, the Hoyt Reavers Festival is for everybody. After the end of the Reaver times, when James VI of Scotland became James I of England as well, he tried to put an end of reaving. He sent a whole load of the Reavers off to, be, um, to, to go to Northern Ireland as plantation owners over there. He sent a whole load off to fight his wars on the continent. And since then, since the beginning of the 17th century, people from this area have been migrating out for various different reasons. We've got people with Reaver ancestry living in America, uh, Australia, Canada, all over the world. And for them, it's a way of connecting to their, their history, to their background, as well as being, still being important for people of Hoyk. Because if you look around Hoyk now and look at the surnames that are predominant in Hoyk, they're exactly the same surnames that were predominant in Reaver times. And you mentioned that the, the Reavers Festival uh, commemorates and educates people about the, the Reaving times. What, what all happens during the, the Reavers Festival weekend in Hoyk? Well, the Reavers Festival actually starts long before the weekend itself. We go into the schools and we engage with the primary schools. We help them to learn a bit about their heritage. In fact, we have to educate the teachers, some of them, about their heritage as well. And we give them that bit of background and get them ready for the festival. During the three days of the festival, we try to offer 
something for everyone. There's outdoor events, indoor events, we have educational talks, we have many reenactments, um, markets, we have lots of demonstrations of how life might have been, a glimpse of it in the Riva Times. And you mentioned uh, the, the importance of surnames. Mm -hmm. What's like, what, what is the, the huge connection between surnames and genealogy and, and the Reavers and the people nowadays? As I mentioned before, it was all about your family. You couldn't trust the English crown, you couldn't trust the Scottish crown to look after you. Your family were your centre of power, your centre of protection. They were everything to you. You would have a headsman and you would be loyal to that headsman. And he would have an overlord as well. My own surname, Tate, uh, is a Scottish bordered name and it's very much centred on Hoyk, despite my English accent. And uh, our overlords were the Kerrs and you still find the Kerrs now at Fernyhurst Castle. My first um, experience at the Reavers Festival was many years ago when I didn't even live in Scotland. And I brought my stepson up, who would have been about eight years old at the time, and dressed him up as a Reaver. We just found out that our surname Tate was a Reaver's surname. And that was my introduction and that got me hooked. I'm a genealogist, so the family side of thing gets me hooked. Um, but I think the best thing about the Reavers Festival is when you stand there after all the planning and preparation, first thing on the in the morning, and see everybody coming into the town with great big smiles on their faces. That's definitely the highlight for me. 2023 marks 20 years of Hoyke Reavers Festival, and over that time, like any event which makes it through 20 years of ups and downs, there is bound to be changes and improvements that have shaped the festival into what it is today. Kath Elliott Walker has been involved in the group since the first festival in 2003 and she sat down with me to discuss how she got involved and how she has seen it change over the years. Um, I looked up the old paperwork the other day out of interest and back in November um, 2002 I was asked to go along to a meeting. If I'm being honest, I'm not sure why I was asked to go to this meeting, but the less history, as they say. But under an organisation that was on the go at that point called the Hoyk Partnership, someone had come up with the idea that Hoyk should have a festival based on the history of fire and steel, which fitted with the Reavers concept. And they got a group of people together who um, might be interested in taking that forward. And um, one of the driving forces back then was the late uh, David Nuttall. And I also remember Madge Elliott, who's another stalwart of the town, being involved wearing her Hoyk Tourist Association hat. But I think the thing that really got it going was the professional help we got at that time through the Hoyk, um, Hoyk Partnership. Um, Joanne Golton was their worker at the time. And I, I would honestly say without her input, I doubt whether we'd ever, ever have got off the ground. But the idea was well received and with help from David, he managed to get lots of clubs and societies along um, to see what we could do. And March 2003 launched the first Reavers Festival. And one of the funniest things, of course, was people saying, why are you having a festival in Hoyk in March? In March is a terrible month to have it. And there was an agreement, yes, well, it's a bit of a risk. But one of the main ideas behind it was starting off the Borders Tourist Fest season and extending that season to be much more of an all-round um, calendar event. So yes, we got to March 2003 and if anybody remembers back, we had a glorious spell, six weeks of lovely, warm, sunny weather that extended, I think, from about um, early March right through to mid-April. And the first festival, people were wandering about in their shirt sleeves in the sun and we thought, well, it could just as easily be pouring with rain in the middle of the summer. So we've stuck with that um, March date ever since. There are other aspects, of course, because it's round about the time when the, t the clock changes. So we're able to have things like the torchlight procession and the fireworks and so on, which you couldn't do in the summer because of the light. It was a much shorter event. There was a concert on the Friday night and then there was activities on the Saturday, if I remember correctly. But there was a lot went on, including music workshops, singing workshops, um, activities, a Kaylee dance, a concert and such like. So it was, it was a pretty full on day and a half. But uh, over the years, we've been able to extend the range of um, activities going on. And some have come, some have gone, some we've had you know, we've resurrected it or left a gap and brought back again. So um, just constantly ring the changes really with it. And I suppose you've got that 
kind of positive that because you've been involved in, in, in all of the festivals, mm. what's the biggest kind of changes you've seen kind of come and go? Um, quite difficult to answer that because we've tried very hard to stick with the theme of um, the Reavers. And we've always also said that it's not about glamorising or glorifying what was a pretty horrible period in our history. It's about trying to give people a real insight into what life was like in that period of time. So I think we've been able over the years to really expand on the number of reenactment groups that we've had along to depict that side of things. And actually, hopefully, through the talks and lectures and everything else, give people a real feeling of it. And we've also, over a number of years, um, we focused on the border family names um, and fortunately we got a funding through Event Scotland Clan Fund for that for a few years which led to probably our biggest festival which was in 2019 um, which really pulled together a lot of the clan names. We also had to explain to people at uh, Scottish level that we don't really call them clans down here, they're families and that, that and they, they understood that difference as well which actually was quite a good um, point of making a differentiation that we were a bit different down here as well. We all know we're different down here anyway but yeah it's uh, it's good to let the rest of the world know that as well and I think that's also been a real interesting one for us as well is the amount of interest that we've gar garnered from around the world and the, how far and wide the border names have spread places like America, Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand, all over the world really but one of the ones that surprised me is the strong link with Northern Ireland, where a lot of, at the end of the reaving period, a lot of the reaver families were given the choice of uh, being hung or going to Ireland. So a lot of them settled in Northern Ireland. I think what we're celebrating is the, the ability of border folk to endure and the strength of character that, that is there historically and is still there, I think, today. That the fact that they are resilient people um, who stand up for what they believe in and uh, that aspect of it I think is something worth celebrating but certainly not celebrating what as I said was a violent period of history and actually a period of history that went on for hundreds of years up till the Union and the Crowns. Initially while it was viewed as a tourist event, um, a, a tourism event to bring people to the town, I think also what has happened over the years is that the town has embraced it in a big way. The town's people have got behind it, particularly through our schools and so forth. So actually our audience is a real mixture of local and visitors, but we've certainly been aware of the, bringing a lot of visitors to the town. And also we see that reflected in, in good economic impact for the businesses in the town itself. Like many events across the globe, 2020 caused huge disruption for the Reavers Festival Committee as they had to cancel the event just a matter of days before it was meant to start. I can remember sitting in my house with the committee about two weeks before the festival was due to happen. It was all in place. Um, and we were, even then, it seemed a difficult decision to make whether we cancelled the festival or not. But we took the decision that we should for the, for the sake of the town uh, in the face of this apparent coming pandemic. And it, interestingly, the weekend that should have been the festival was the weekend the whole country went into lockdown. So even two weeks before it seemed a difficult decision to make but it was absolutely the right one. So that year we did absolutely nothing obviously um, along with everybody else in the country. Yeah. Um, it, it was a difficult decision even though it was we were only I think it was two weeks away for the first measures coming in although we didn't ken that at the time. Um, it was it was an agonised decision for us, ah, but just for the, the the simple point of view of, of, of folks' health, it, we just had to do it. We had to do it, and it were proved that it was a very wise decision at the time. But it wasn't as easy as you'd imagine. Looking back, it seems right, oh, no brainer. But at the time, it was it was a toughie. We took the decision to try and do a virtual festival in 2021. And actually we're indebted to lots of groups and again organisations who did their own videoing for us so that we could actually bring it all together as an event. And I think the, the range of um, audience from literally worldwide, as you've just said, was amazing to us and very gratifying. And uh, I think the quote was that we had viewed from every continent in the world except Antarctica. So, um, And we did have a gentleman on the f messaging 
five minutes after we were due to go live from the uh, from the coast of America saying why hadn't we gone live and we had to tell him to refresh his browser because we had. We took the decision to go live, you know, have a live festival in, in 2022 again but we did actually feel it was more about um, a local festival in a way. It was to give back something to happen in the town because people were just coming out of Covid and let's have an event that will get the community together again. We didn't say we weren't inviting visitors, but we didn't perhaps promote it as widely with travel restrictions still being in place and people just beginning to get their confidence back again. But we did still attract a good number of visitors to the town and the town was buzzing that weekend. And again, we were fortunate in 2022 with the weather, which helped enormously. It's, um, so yes, it was a slightly scaled back version and there were some events that are popular that we decided not to have because of the potential risk of having a lot of people in enclosed spaces. One of the key figures in the planning of the festival, particularly the encampment activities, is Keith Douglas, who is one of the local reenactors and has been involved with the festival for a number of years. Well, it was 15 years ago, my son was involved with a David Dill steel bonnets. It was Kent as a the Klansman then. And they were short. And I says, have you got any spare kit? And they says, aye. And we can put you on a, a one day insurance cover for the day. I says, fine. And uh, I got a kit to and enjoyed the, the banter with the public, showing them the, the kit, getting the weapons, the helmets. And since then I've it is growing as a hobby. You're trying to explain or describe what it was like. You're in, you're in as reasonably authentic kit as you can get or buy or make and try to describe to them what it was like living in the days. You always say there was, if there's kids there, you always say there was no McDonald's. Their faces drop thinking, my God, there's no McDonald's. <laughs> And he had to go into the river and get water and all the rest of it. And just explaining them how different life was then and cheap to what it is now. You've missed friends, other reenactors that you usually meet every year. It knocked the continuity out of the fact that you were going to certain places every year and meeting the same folk. Uh, it was a miss, definitely a miss. Uh, not any reenactor will tell you. A lot of them actually folded because of it, because they've got to an age where they're, they thought, we've had a break, and with the second year along, they says, I'm just no bother. And sadly, a lot of the reenacting groups are older people, and there is younger folk there, they get it wrong, but the majority are going to get known in their age. And has an effect, you just say, they've a lot of travel, 500 miles this weekend. So, but, based on that then, how important was it and how good was it to then be all back together again last year? Oh, brilliant. Everybody was fair looking for it. They, they were desperate to get on the move again, meet folk. It was like meeting old friends after years and years. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, one of the <clears> most <throat> important parts of the Rivers Festival is the kids. And in the build-up to the festival, you managed to get into the schools to kind of educate the kids. What's that like and how do you try and put it across them? Well, we go dressed in kit and we take some kit with you, weapons and helmets. And uh, it, it's a rami to start off with until the teacher whistles or, does, or claps her hands and they're all going quiet. And then you just explain to them what your kit is for, what the, what the swords do. You just go through your your whole routine, what they ate, <coughs> how they got about, where they went, uh, how they lived, and uh, at the end of it you give them a chance to come up and try the, the helmets or see what they were like with the weapons. They're not allowed to swing them about obviously, but they get a chance to have a go and they all line up and they're quite and they're fair chuffed. And do you think, well, as well as obviously you guys going into schools and then they also get involved with the games and the parade. Do you think, it, do you think that by the end of it, the kids really have a sense of belonging to the Reavers? Hopefully, that's the idea, because who try and encourage them? Who give them, come on, give them a roar, and they're fully on their 
The Greyheads are great, they really are. As we well know, events like these don't just take a few days to organise, with many people chipping in to help the core organisers produce the flourishing festival each March. But what does the organisers' timeline look like? Well, I think uh, for this 20th anniversary year, it started right after the, the festival finished. And we were talking about it before we got to the festival, in fact. But it started right after, and it's been... No, I mean, no every week, every month, okay, but sort of monthly, maybe a space hour the, the summer holidays, but it's been a regular meeting right through. And it is, we, we normally start about September. We have our AGM in September, and for then it's regular meetings right through to the, the festival. With an impressive 20 years in the bog, the Reavers Festival has contributed plenty to the town of Hoyk as well as the Scottish borders. But what do the committee think the Reavers Festival will look like in the future? Hopefully we could build on it, but it's going to be awkward just with finances and everything. We just hope that this one will be the kick-off to maybe build even bigger, because the bigger it gets, the more groups you'll get to come and it encourages other people to come. So. The River Festival wouldn't be where it is today without a huge amount of input from the town. We're totally dependent on lots of the organisations, Callants Club, Moss Troopers, um, the drama groups and everything else, and particularly the schools, for all pulling together to make it happen. It's, it really is, to my mind, a great example of this community, the strength of this community's ability to work together. I would very much hope that we're all, we'll still be here in another 20 years' time. I personally probably won't be involved, but um, I would very much hope that the festival is and because I do see it as now become an integral part of the Borders and Hoyk calendar. I think there is still a lot of scope for um, growth and development within the festival. Um, we've always tried to keep as much as we can free to the, the public, so we are inevitably funding dependent, but uh, as I said, what we've found is that people do seem to value what we're doing, so I would very much hope that the future, the future of the festival is, is secure. However, we do need people to come forward and help run it because, as I said, we've had a very, very strong um, committee over the years. But, you know, we're always looking for new people to come along with ideas and with um, getting, getting involved to make it happen. I would have to say I get a lot of personal satisfaction out of it. The fact that we've got from zero to 20 years is, um, you know, quite, to me, quite a... a a major thing and I, I do believe it is a really um, unifying thing within the community and that, as I said it, it does bring people together and it does have an economic benefit from for the town but uh, I'm also very aware that we've got a really really good committee who work together really well and with I cannot really honestly remember any animosity over 20 years it's just people have a common aim, they come in, we talk about what we need to do and we go away and do it. And it's been gratifying over that time the number of people have said that they've enjoyed coming to Reaver Festival meetings, that they just see it as a positive thing for the town. This year is our 20th Hoyk Reavers Festival and it takes place between Friday 24th and Sunday 26th of March 2023. Celebrating a turbulent past and a culture of fire and steel, opening with ghost walks on the Friday evening, also at the George Duff Band in concert at the Heart of Hoyk. On Saturday, there's a warm welcome to all at the 16th Century Market, Reavers Encampment, illustrated talks and performances from our local school children before the evening torchlight procession, which finishes with a spectacular fireworks display. Then round the day off by relaxing at the Reavers Banquet. Sunday sees a guided walk of part of Hoyk Common, and the second day of battle reenactments, including archery and a falconry display. Visit hoikreavers.com and our Facebook page for more details on these and other events. So come and visit Hoik Reavers Festival between Friday 24th and Sunday 26th of March 2023. Hi, River, I will be. will ride across the border and meet some triumphantly.